Ah, sorry, I was not on mute. I just got, since Steve's gone right now, I'm Sue Ellen McComas. I teach at Bowling Green and I teach at Firelands campus. So nice to see y'all here. I love, Sandra, you know, I love your work. And um, I try to use arts-based things in my classroom as much as possible. So anytime Sandra speaks, I'm here because I want to always learn more because you're just never too old. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Hi, Sue. I don't know, I popped off, I disappeared. Um, Oh, you, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, it seems that maybe people need to mute their microphones because we're getting some feedback. Yeah, that would be good. All right. All right, so it's so great to have everybody. What I was saying is I got dropped off and we have people from all over. We have a nice global gathering here. So this is really great. Um, and uh, I think, does anybody else want to introduce himself? We have people from Nepal. We have people from Rio, I think Rio de Janeiro, Roberto. Um, we have uh, people from up in, from where I'm at. I'm in Perrysburg, Ohio, in Canada, in Columbus, Ohio, to, uh, what were some of the other places that I missed out on? We got California. Where were some other places we have people from? Lexington, Kentucky. Hey, Leanna. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. A Kentucky and living in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> awesome. We have Jennifer's in Minneapolis. That's great. Victoria from Liverpool, United Kingdom. Oh, hi, Victoria. Good afternoon over there. Atlanta, Georgia, but was living in Columbus uh, for a cool. while. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Francis, Francis is in, is in uh, Georgia as well. She's going to be sending me some Georgia peaches. She told me we had a meet, we had a chat this morning, so I'm going to get some Georgia peaches. She and I are sweet potato pie makers, so she gave me her sweet potato pie. So every Thanksgiving we make sweet potato pie, and I think I'm going to have to make some um, peach bread. Because Francis makes peach uh, bread, so I'm gonna make some of that. So I'm gonna learn how to do that. Somebody else is gonna say something, I think. Somebody somewhere. Yeah, I was gonna say I missed introduction. Sorry, I was making a tea. Um, my name is actually Bernadette, but everyone has always called me Bird. Um, I'm just in. I'm at Bowling Green with Dr. Faulkner, but I'm technically in Perrysburg as well. <laughs> I believe well, you can come over and have some some peach bread when I when I make it after I get some peaches. So let's jump in. I think we should uh, all get started and. Tisha, thanks for getting everything organized and setting us all up. Tisha is a doctoral student in our uh, doctorate in organization development change at Bowling Green State University and a graduate and research assistant in our program. And we have other students here from the program. Welcome to everybody, people that are coming in. Some people have been here from the very beginning, our first cohort, because we're moving into our third cohort. So let's just jump in because we have a lot of fun stuff to hear and connect with Sandra around. So I want to go ahead and get the uh, ball rolling here. And I'll see if it opens the right screen. Yep, there we go. So again, welcome to our, our ODNC, Organization Development and Change Symposia at the uh, Schmidt Horse College of Business in uh, Bowling Green, Ohio, at Bowling Green State University. And we have a variety of graduate programs that are a part of what we do. And I, we have our doctorate in Organization Development and Change. We have one of the oldest in the world, Masters in Organization Development programs also. Um, both programs, you know, are AACSB accredited and higher learning commission. And the focus of our, our doctorate program really came out of talking with and co-creating a program with and by our students. Our students are working professionals. We, 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 I, I refer to our students as professional scholars. Uh, and they are out working, doing really amazing work. The average age of our, of our doctorate group is in uh, like 40, I think it's about 48 years old. Um, we are in our third cohort. They are doing amazing work all around the world and uh, working on very important projects. And they're using the dissertation and their work in the program as a way to expand uh, their career mix, their career portfolio, and uh, experience joy. And we talk about professional joy. It's when you're doing what you want, where you want, with whom you want, making the living you want. 
And it's in those moments that we go, man, this is awesome. Doing what we love and, and having a career doing that and building our own identity around that professional pursuit and that difference we want to make as thought leaders in the world. Uh, so welcome. Welcome from our students, our faculty, our program, and our, and our college. And we are so glad to have um, Sandra here with us. What we want to do is bring evidence-based perspectives to those who are transforming organizations, revitalizing communities, and developing human potential. And what we're going to do is briefly introduce and then move into our keynote speaker uh, with Sandra. We'll have some small group reflection, a whole room Q&A, and then, then we'll, we'll come back and we'll kind of reflect as we leave kind of what, what the takeaway is from that. And then we'll uh, invite you to our next sessions. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Sandra, Dr. Faulkner, and she's a BGSU professor here with us in her area of expertise is poetic inquiry. Her focus is going to be on poetic inquiry as a transformational research and teaching practice. And uh, we're going to jump right in with her right now. And uh, I'd like to turn it over. Sandra, uh, you can, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I have to say, you know, I, I want to tell you that uh, we have a, one of our students took your class as, a, as an elective and has become a fan of yours who loves your work and has been sharing what you're doing and how important and how profound it is and how much it's impacted them. So thank you for being willing to share what uh, he has been experiencing with the rest of us because I'm very curious. I want to learn more. Oh, terrific. Um, and, and that was Doug. <laughs> So, and I, I will be talking about one of the projects that we did in that class um, with Doug. So I just wanna thank you for um, the invitation to speak with you all today. I'm delighted to be talking with you from my home office in Bowling Green, Ohio in the US. And the land on which I'm speaking to you from has long been a gathering and meeting space for peoples of the Erie, Cherokee, and Shawnee nations. I honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory. And it, if there's anyone with visual impairment, I'm gonna describe myself. Um, I'm a middle-aged, fair-skinned white woman with medium, medium length chestnut brown hair. I'm wearing mint green glasses and I'm dressed in a white shirt with black polka dots and a tomato red blazer. So what I'm gonna talk about today is poetic inquiry as a feminist liberatory methodology that can enhance our teaching and our research practice. It's a form of art-based research that highlights the aesthetics of personal experience, focuses on embodiment and participatory measures and uses artistic forms to meld scientific and humanistic understanding. And what I'm gonna focus on are the benefits and uses of poetry as research and teaching practice through a discussion of definitions of poetic inquiry, the power of poetic inquiry, and I'm gonna give you some examples of poetic inquiry and research. And we're gonna be doing um, a few um, exercises. I also wanna point out at the very top of the chat, I have put a PDF file there for you all to download. It has a list of references um, for, from my talk today, as well as um, two slides that have some of the exercises. We're gonna be able to do one in, like one during this time, but I don't think we'll have time to do the other two. And I think that you'll be hopefully be inspired through my talk to do these exercises on your own. So they're all there in that PDF file for you. Um, oh, I can put, okay. Yeah, let me go ahead and post it before I get started in case, in case I forget. Okay, so I just po I just posted it um, in the chat. Okay, so yeah. for, for you all. All right, perfect. Okay. So I wanna talk about how I came to poetic inquiry. I'm a poet, a feminist ethnographer, partner and teacher who studies close relationships. And I use poetic inquiry as a way to show the messy work of living a feminist life being a feminist scholar and teacher, being a feminist partner and mother and doing feminist relationship research. And you can also use poetry in your research, teaching and praxis as a, and then now you fill in the blank, scholar. I began using poetry in my work as a scholar who studies close relationships when I need to talk about identity and communication in a more nuanced fashion. 
And I wanted to describe the physicality and motionality of doing research. I've written poetry since childhood and I often write poems when I'm trying to make sense of difficult life experiences such as cancer and motherhood. And shortly after finishing my PhD, many, many years ago, when I was engaged in a project on LGBTQ Jewish identity, I merged my poetry practice with my social science training by presenting the narrative research as poetry. Writing poetry helped me recover from my training in graduate school, sorry, um, those of you who are still right in graduate school, right, and the numbing realities of academic writing. It helped me reclaim creativity and its rhythms. I felt that the twists and turns in the research study showing my reflexivity as a feminist scholar and the bodily experience of doing and being a feminist ethnographer were best presented as poetry. I write poetry because I'm a bad social scientist. I study personal relationships, but I'm most interested in what relationships feel like and sound like and smell like more than how they function as some kind of analytic variable to be deconstructed. I believe in poetic truths more than social science truth punctuated with a capital T. What I understand is that one can write poetry as social science. What I believe in is the value of poetry as relationship research. I want to share a poem now that goes with the photo that's on this slide that you'll see there behind me um, from a project called Butter Nostalgia, which was about family stories and caregiving during COVID that was just published in the journal of Social and Personal Relationships. Giant Ginger Snaps. My ex texts to ask about her gazpacho, the taste is too sharp, the afterbite too acrid. I advise her to try a teaspoon of honey, though I am always less precise, tossing in garlic until it smells right, tasting my way through a recipe like my dad taught me when I was his Comey chef. We cook by intuition and feel, follow our inner hunger. He liked the onion chopped in big pieces so you could see it in the finished dish have something substantial to chew, no disguising the bite of allium. Once she or, or some other ex called me a kitchen Nazi because I know what I want in the kitchen and I won't back down, my sense of self too strong. From the time I learned not to smile for the camera because I'm not smiling on the inside, so why lie? I mail her a box of ginger snaps every Christmas because they're her favorite of the recipes I copied down by hand from my parents' cookbook stash, my inheritance from a line of family cooks. In poetry then, I show my embodiment as a feminist, as a scholar, and as a teacher who fuels their way through research with mind and body. Poetry can help us see our relationships bleeding out, hemorrhaging from the inside, filling outside the neat axioms of theory. Poetry is theory. Poetry can have us experience the social structures and ruptures in situ as we read, as we listen, as we hold our breath, waiting for the next line. Poetry is bandage and salve. Poetry lets me goodwill my security cloak of citations argue in verse that there is space for critical work and personal experience in the study of close relationships. And I'd also like to add that using poetry in the classroom makes for more engaged teaching practice, at least in my experience, students respond to poetry, both their own, right, and others. And so Denzen, Norm Denzen talks about says this, the poet makes the world visible in new and different ways, in ways ordinary social science writing does not allow. The poet is accessible, visible, and present in the text in ways that traditional writing forms discourage. Poetry is a good vehicle for showing multiple experiences and interpretations. It can help us shape lives in the ways that we want to live. We create and tell stories that advocate for social justice and change. It's good for doing embodied work. And yes, poetry has the limitations of language, of course, but it also offers the possibilities and capaciousness of language and poetic forms. Um, as Gradle said, 
poetry allows us to hear the tread of another through their experiences, and it compels us to explore a different way of capturing social science research. Poetry is able to position dialectics and demonstrate the fluidity of identities and identity negotiation processes. Poetry doesn't have to resolve tensions. It can render them in multiple hues, shades, and nuances. Poetry is a language of emotion and possibility. Poetry is a language of rage and joy. Listening to and writing poetry offers new ways of understanding, demonstrates our limitless imaginations, and it can be an embodied experience. Carl Lego once said, poetry creates or makes the world in words. Poetry calls attention to itself as a text, as a rhetorical device and stratagem. Poetry does not invite readers to consume the text as if it were a husk that contains a pithy truth. Poetry invites us to listen. Poetry is a site for dwelling, for holding up, for stopping. Poetry is about rhythm. Poetry creates textual spaces that invite and create ways of knowing and becoming in the world. Poetry invites interactive responses, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and aesthetic responses. Poetry invites ways of uniting the heart, mind, imagination, body, and spirit. And I, I believe that I have become a better teacher and social scientist since using poetic inquiry in my research and pedagogical practice. I think that the power of poetry can make this the case for others too. And in some ways I'm hoping to convince you of that. I find that poetry makes all of our lives better because of the articulation of the pain, joy, love, and loss in our collective human condition. It may be difficult for someone to find themselves in their story in a traditional rendering of a research project sometimes, but in poetry, um, people can see themselves and relate. Um, and anyone can write a poem, we're about to in just a moment. And think about it, how many of us have turned to verse when losing a pet, a lover, a parent? Um, and I'm going to bet that the only people who read my dissertation, which was written in a typical dissertation format, was my committee. I mean, I know that I gave a copy to my parents, but I'm pretty sure they never read it. So, but poetry, you know, but my poetry, now that's something that anyone can engage with. And I find that writing poetry helps me articulate my feelings and thoughts, and this makes me a better partner, teacher, community member, and mother. And that, that power of poetry is available to all of us. Poetry offers a way to tell embodied evocative stories that engage academic and non-academic audiences. Poetry and research is a way to tap into universality and radical subjectivity. The poet uses personal experience and research to create something from the particular, which becomes universal when the audience relates to, embodies and or experiences the work as if it were their own. Now we're going to play a game called Exquisite Corpse. Um, and this is a, this is a um, parlor game that the Surrealists used to play that uses images and words collectively, but you typically hide half of the writing or the drawing until the end to see what can occur. And the idea is that by doing this, you upturn some of your usual habits of thought. Um, I have, um, you can you can look up write this this game online. It can help uncover group angst and reveal collective unconsciousness. Um, you know, sometimes um, we might have some rules for that, like that you use certain lines or images or or, or um, a word count, or you might use some kind of form. Okay. We're gonna play this now and I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. So what you're going to do is you're going to write a line in the chat box. Okay, but don't hit enter, right, until I say go. And what that line is, it should reflect the following prompt. Poetry is, okay, and you're gonna write a line that fills that in. So I want you all to write a line in the chat box and when I say in, when, and then you will hit enter when I say go. So I'll give you, I'll give you a moment.
60 more seconds. Go. Okay. So poetry is elusive, a world full of possibilities, a journey of conceptual reflection and discovery. Poetry is a challenge and opportunity. Living in a spiritual world, I'm, I'm sorry, living in a spiritual and deeper place and sharing it in words, an autopsy of the body politic, a way of seeing as if it were the first time, a constellation of metaphors of ourselves, Poetry is a way to stimulate, cultivate creativity, empathy, and understanding, self-reflection shared with others, a puzzle, the afternoon tea of the soul, the heart's most earnest yearnings, almost every place I want to go. Poetry is a way to unstick the story that has so much impact on one's body, full sentence and thoughts just do not come, expanded breath of world consciousness, breath, resistant to containment, an opportunity for breath, conveying a multiple sensory experience through writing and or spoken word, the ineffable discernment of taste buds, the instance they encounter biryani, important means of self-expression. Poetry is creativity in many short phrases combined as an art of emotion. Poetry is beautiful to read, tough to write for some. Wow, okay, so. We just created an Ars Poetica poem, which is the art of poetry. Yeah, phenomenal. I, I agree, right? So, and this is often something that um, we might use to introduce someone to poetry. I find that I will write an Ars Poetica poem every so often just to kind of remind myself of what you know I'm feeling about poetry. And this, this game, Exquisite Corpse, that we just... Um, yeah, Heather, I'm impressed too, right? We do have some, see? We, do, we just wrote a poem collectively. And Exquisite Corpse is a great, is a great um, exercise for collaboration and research teams. Writing poems collaboratively can be a good way to do poetic analysis. It can be part of reflective research practice. I know that I use it um, in you know, my classes all the time. It's a way to team build and prime the space for collaborative work. Um, and you know, you just might find some new insights into research and teaching and find different ways of presenting your work right through this collaboration process. And there's, there's multitudes of ways that you can play this. I've played it with words and images before. Um, so. so there we have it, exquisite corpse. So. Poet, you know, why poetic inquiry then? Um, poetry may be considered a special language, right, that um, researchers want to access when they feel that other modes of representation won't capture what they want to show about their work and their research participants. When they want to explore knowledge claims and write with more engagement and connection. When the researcher's story intersects or intertwines with research participants' lives, to mediate different understandings, to, prevent, to present embodied experience and to reach more diverse audiences. Um, Galvin and Prendergast say that poetic inquiry offers A, the possibility of participation, participative writing and transcendence of disciplinary boundaries, B, engagement in more aesthetic ways of knowing and C, honoring of the relational realities of the presence a phenomenon. So poetic inquiry is a form of art-based research that highlights the aesthetics of personal experience. It focuses on embodiment and participatory measures and uses artistic forms to meld scientific and human understandings. Poetic inquiry is the use of poetry, craft, and this is um, some of the definitions that I offer in um, you know, my book, Poetic Inquiry, Craft Method and Practice. So a lot of the exercises um, and some of the ideas that I'm talking about today um, are in that book. 
but poetic inquiry is the use of poetry crafted from research endeavors either before the pro a project analysis as a project analysis and or poetry that's part of or constitutes an entire research project so the key feature of poetic inquiry is the use of poetry as inquiry in inquiry and for inquiry and it may and again you know come at multiple parts right of the research process um poetry used as qualitative research is a method of turning research interviews transcripts observations personal experience and reflections into poems or poetic forms and I'm just thinking about scholars in communication studies, at least from, from where I'm situated, have been using poetic inquiry to study identities and identity negotiation processes, critique dominant understandings of motherhood, present relationship processes like breaking up, question the status quo in family communication research, and show reflective research practices. And as you can probably guess, poetic inquiry is really a transdisciplinary right practice so it's it's across right art disciplines another thing is that that poetry can be political and so i wanted to talk about the idea of poetry and social change poetic inquiry can be an active response to social inequities writing and performing and publishing poetry is an important political activity right as is poetic inquiry Jay Perini wrote that the poet's work is politically powerful because the language of poetry provides deep understanding in ways that other writing does not. Many poets engage politics through their writing, bypassing stifling social structures. Poets present marginalized groups in positions in nuanced, sensitive, and myriad ways. As Fisher argued, the political task of poetry is a visionary one. The world, the work of making way for new worlds and, and words. Poetry confront social structures to engage audience is and activate poetry's political potential. So poetry can engage a political voice. Um, Denzen talks about poetry is powerful because it helps us to critique power structures. It helps us shape lives in ways that we want to live. Prendergast says, I'm interested in social poetry as the core mandate for critical poetic inquirers who work is in support of equity, human rights, and justice worldwide. Critical poetic inquiry invites us to engage as active witnesses within our research sites, as witnesses standing beside participants in their search for justice, recognition, healing, a better life. Um, Richardson talks about poetic inquiry um, is important because it makes the act of writing conspicuous by attending to particulars in opposition to transparent and visible scientific writing that focuses on comparative frameworks. Poetry challenges dominant discourses inside and outside of the academy to show that everything is constructed in language. Our experiences are all epistemologically and ontologically composed and understood in words our words and others words um, and i also argue that poetry can unmask hidden cultural assumptions which is why it can be valuable in activist projects and so i know that i've used um, poetic inquiry in studying such things as sexual harassment and i've, I've published um, some work on that so to kind of sum up right the the power then of poetic inquiry you know, poetic inquiry is a form of feminist methodology that helps us to collapse that false divide between the public and the private. It's a form of embodied inquiry and it's, um, you know, political response. It can be a catalyst for social agitation and change. It is a form of feminist practice. Um, feminist theorists view embodiment as an important concept in feminist theory, research and practice. And many argue that theory arises out of our embodied experiences. And so poetic inquiry is one means of doing embodied inquiry. Poetry promises to return researchers back to the body in order to demonstrate how our theories arise out of embodied experience. Um, and at its 
best, um, and this James is saying this, at its best, poetic inquiry bootstraps comprehension of a research topic, energizes inquiry and challenges how we come to knowledge and what we think we know, undercutting disciplinary discursive norms. So poetic inquiry can be a needed intervention in our research practices and in our classrooms. You can take a both and approach using poetic inquiry. It offers a way to engage right, this, um, that, that public private dichotomy. Um, and as Jung says, you know, a, a poem asserts itself as poetry by being in dialogue with what it resists. And so it's a way to show the both and, right? Rather than having some neat, um, you know, art articulations. Um, and, you know, we need facts and statistics about pressing social problems, right? So I'm not, you know, throwing out, right, scientific research now, because remember, I'm trained as a social scientist, right? Um, but we need both, right, facts and statistics about pressing social problems like sexism, xenophobia, ableism, racism. But we also need the stories and the poetry about the way these feel, the concrete details about how it feels to fight against oppressive systems. Art is always a call to action. Art, right, in, in poetry gives the emotional voice to the facts the individual stories behind the aggregate, the face and name to the theory, the emotional appeal or ethos to the logical findings. And we know that policy is often created from emotional appeals. Now, I wanna talk about um, a recent project that um, the Poetic Portrait Project that is um, demonstrates really this poetic inquiry in both teaching and research practice. And so this was a project that um, I had undertaken in the spring of 2021. And I did life story interviews. Um, a colleague of mine in gerontology and I did life story interviews with 18 older women, that is 60 plus about their lives, how their relationships developed across a life course and how they've maintained their relationships. And yes, we did also talk about um, how they've maintained relationships right during COVID. Um, now students in my graduate relational communication class then crafted poetic transcripts of the interviews. So there was, you know, one student um, sat in on each interview. Okay, so one, um, you know, each one student sat in on each of the interviews um, and then crafted a poetic transcription, which is a way of, you know, rather than a traditional transcript, um, you know, you would pay attention to the way that it looked on the page. And they used that poetic transcript that they created to then create a visual and poetic portrait of each woman. And these poetic portraits were a representation of the interviewee in verse that focused on the embodied aspects of their life story. And they gave the poetic portrait back to write the participant. And what, um, and so my, my colleague and I are currently, you know, working on, um, you know, uh, publishing this idea of, of um, poetic portraits, but what we were interested in then with these, these portraits that the students created was, what do poetic portraits tell us about women's relationships? Two, you know, how do poetic portraits influence the stories that get told? Three, how did the process of doing poetic portraits influence students' sense of themselves as researchers? Because we had students also reflect on right, that process of doing poetic portraits. And four, how is the process of creating poetic portraits reflective research practice? Because these are some of the arguments right, that, that we um, were making. Now, I wanna show you some, um, some of the um, poems that I had written from these, these interviews. And this is um, the idea of a skinny poem. And one of the questions that we asked participants was, what do you know now about relationships that you wish you'd known when you were young? And it, this was near the end of the interview and it was really fascinating to write here, write these answers. And I was trying to figure out, well, how do 
And I came across this um, idea of a skinny palm. And I have 18, right, 18 of these. So Marilyn 81 said, I did my best. Why am I here? Vulnerability with key friends. Vulnerability, my best effort. Vulnerability, here I am. Why? Judy at 73 year old, years old confesses, I wish I had been nicer to my sisters. Listen to what is not being said. Emotion thrown like caution, emoting what people need, emotional to listen, not being what is said. At 70, Nelda learns that when a guy is in pursuit mode, he is not what you're going to see later. You need information about what will be revealed, what smart women know, what you need information about. And so these are examples of some skinny poems that I had written from that, um, from that particular question. And in 2005, Truth Thomas created this, the skinny, which is the form that I just presented during a poetry workshop at Howard University. And it's, it's a short poem. It consists of 11 lines. The first and 11th lines can be any length. Um, the 11th and last line um, have to be repeated, right, using the same words, right, but you don't have to necessarily put them in the same order. The second, sixth, and 10th lines have to be identical. And all the lines, except for the first and last, are comprised of only one word. So I'm going to say it's kind of a, it's, it's a challenging, right, exercise, but it's a really good form to convey a vivid image, which is what I hope that you saw in the previous poems. And Thomas considers this form best for reflecting more serious concerns facing humankind, though really the form can be used with any subject. And I'm thinking that it worked out pretty well with that particular question from the interviews and you can even use it like a series of of linked poems like with you know a series of haiku and so i do have a series of 18 right of the skinny poems um representing answers to that particular question and this idea of the short poem reminds me of some of the goals of lyric poetry, which is to use condensed images to express personal feelings and show emotional context and kind of musical lines. Um, Randall Brown, who was the editor of the journal Compressed Creative Arts, talks about um, a short compressed poem this way. Skinny refers to the way it looks on the page, as well as the weightlessness. The poem should have a swift, sudden feel, therefore lean language is imperative. Keywords are brevity, intensity, and precision. A good condensed poem should be memorable for its reading duration and its longer impression. Okay, so um, now I'm, for time's sake, I'm not going to have you try writing a skinny poem right now, but I did remember in the PDF packet, you've got right this slide and so you can look up um you can look up the form there's there's a um there's a there's a link there and try writing a short poem then from if you have a research journal i hope you keep that or maybe you have an interview transcript or two maybe you have some field notes but try using that as a model and then consider Brown's idea of the compressed poem as ling language and weightless feel. You might wanna try the skinny poem um, like Thomas had, right, had suggested, right? And so those again were my three poems, I mean, three of the 18 that I had done. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one of your assignments, right, for, for doing at home. And I wanted to um, end by talking about some research examples and some of my own work. And I won't um, spend too much time talking about this so we can um, get into some discussion. Um, but I wanted, there's three, three um, recent projects that I've used. Um, and Trigger Warning, which was um, embodied response to news headlines. I had written some poems um, following the news cycle for a year. And I was connecting through poetry, connecting personal experience to larger issues of race and class and gender. 
And the idea was to show feminist theories everyday practice. So these were like just poems that I wrote in response to things right that were in my news feed. Um, and I make the argument that those poems kind of in response to that were a part of everyday theorizing. A second um, research project I have is called Bringing Up Baby, and it's some, um, it was a, a different take on a baby book. And so I have some collage and some found poems in there where um, I critique traditional understandings of mothering. Um, I'm using the, um, and they're, they're very much um, visual poems, right? That, that look at images and text. And the idea is that, um, you know, it's trying to evoke um, and be an embodied form while also positioning and engaging those ideas of dialect, you know, dialectics. So, you know, mothering is both joy and um, terror, right? For instance. Um, and then finally, um, Better Nostalgia, I had shared one of the poems from that at the, be at the beginning, um, which was um, a, look of, a poetic inquiry into family stories and caregiving, um, specifically around um, COVID. But again, here's another example of like everyday theorizing um, and trying to, um, again, you know, position some of the dialectics, you know, as a form of, um, looking at identity negotiation and families and really pushing back against um you know family and cultural expectations right of what it means to be a mother what it means to be a, a daughter right what it means to be a partner um and i'm going to give you just um here's one example from trigger warning um and this is in response to a headline um january 26 2018 where Cortland sykes had said you know i want to come home to a home cooked dinner at six every night one that she fixes and one that i expect one day my daughters to learn to fix after they become traditional homemakers and family wives think norman rockwell here and gloria steinem be damned so i had all kinds of feelings about this and so I wrote this poem called Feminists of God. She will sliver your smooth pain, belly birth, the banshee snakes you see writhing at the stake, smack your natural womanhood. And when you take goofy aim, demand she fix a cake, she will devil your male ache with the side of hell crazed bacon. She will bite your ivory nails as she rides your slosh steer spurs out like an invert male watch her shotgun your beer in the name of manhood all hail the sexist feminist leer and so this poem is part of the chapbook of anthographic feminist poetry that i call trigger warning and in it you know as i had mentioned i respond to media headlines about violence gender race and class through verse and, you know, for me, this presentation is, you know, part of the idea of living a feminist life, as Sarah Ahmed talks about. And as I would mentioned before, I often will write poetry as a way to understand and articulate bodily experiences and a way to show feminist theory as an everyday practice, um, which is what I was doing here. And feminist ethnographic poetry then offers us a mean to develop theoretical insights, to engage in feminist liberatory work by advocating for social change and justice. And using poetry in an ethnographic project is a way to demonstrate anthropological insights, to tell a story about field work through the telling, retelling, and framing of embodied experiences with a poetic sensibility. At least that's what I try to do in my work. Um, the next, the second um, project that I wanted to talk about was the poetry collection Bringing Up Baby. And I'm using poetic inquiry to tell, um, you know, some more about um, mothering um, and um, parenting in verse and how it's shaped by family history, place, feminist critique. And I'm using this right as a critical form of interpersonal communication research and specifically to critique white middle class notions of mothering and motherhood right through this use of poetic voice and this collection there's two distinct types of pieces and what you see here are some mashups of, of a baby book. Um, and in these collages, what you see is I juxtapose images, texts, and reflections from my unfinished baby book and my daughter's never begun baby book 
in a reimagined kind of scrapbook wherein two mothers, my mother and myself, are conversing in lives of poetry about being mother and the white middle class expectations of motherhood that mean a mother is never good enough. And actually, I might argue that kinds of cuts across all kind of class lines. Nobody's ever right good enough. And so I've used pages from my baby book that my mom never filled in, notes from the pediatrician and my daughter's pediatrician. There's some sonogram images. And there's text from feminist theory, right? So this is all collaged on onto here. Um, there's another set of, of pieces then um, that take parts of the book, what to expect when you're expecting. And I use erasure and collage. Um, there's, that's a very popular guide to pregnancy and childbirth. Unfortunately, I found it kind of insulting. Um, and a bit heterosexist and a bit hegemonic when I got it from my obstetrician's office. And, you know, at first I read the guide, you know, like, like you're supposed to you. Um, but then I just finally like quit. And what I ended up with were some, I've got six of these mixed media pieces that I think allow for more of a range of feelings about pregnancy and they critique dominant narratives of pregnancy and childbirth. And I know you can't um, you know, read the text in there. I'll read it to you in just a moment. Um, but they're also, these pieces have, have like reused pieces of sweater that I accidentally knit um, and got felted in the wash. And um, you know, there's, there's crayon and all kinds of things that you would think about when you would think about, um, about, about children. And this is really the collage is a way to play with the image and the text and to expand the possibilities of text and story to show how poetic inquiry right on family cultural history shape that poetic voice and how poetic voice is a form of feminist theorizing and an example of interpersonal feminist scholarship which is where i position myself um, and you probably can't, so what the text, the text that is um, revealed there, nine months, read the small print, honey, sugar, you can suspect to be separated. The third project and final project that I wanna talk about is um, called Buttered Nostalgia. And I began this project after spending 11 days with my elderly parents in March of 2020, um, right when um, COVID lockdowns began. Um, and I was terrified at that time that I had somehow brought them COVID, right, at the same time. I mean, we didn't know, right, much back, back at that time. Um, at the same time that I was grateful for the time that I got to spend with them, um, and I made that trip from Bowling Green, Ohio, right here to Georgia. My parents live outside of Atlanta with the thought really that could be the last time that I saw them because they weren't in good health. You know, at the time, um, you know, my mother was 81 and had a heart condition and my father was 79 and had COPD. But during that visit, I cooked and cleaned for them, listened to all kinds of family stories and what resulted in this project was a way to tell family stories in language that best represented my experience of family through poetry, recipes, and images. And the pieces here are meant to look like recipe cards. You probably can't see them, but there are, there are family recipes on every single one, right, of these images. And I had taken, um, so it's really a restoring of, you know, the idea of a, a family photo album as well. And so I wanted to include, right, photos with text that somehow pushed, right, the limits of each genre. Um, and so there are poems on here. These were, um, these are some family photos, right, that were on here. This was a recipe for um, my mom's hot milk sponge cake. And I'm going to read the poem that was, you know, that's attached to that. Mom's hot milk sponge. Dear mom, I made your cake today since I can't see your face through the pixelated screen. Butter and sugar your solution for a child's boredom. So many rainy Sundays and teacher appreciation Mondays. 
wish you could taste how you got it right. Um, and so this collection, and there's there's some um, you know there's some more poems and and there's vignettes right about that time of, of caring for them. And the entire collection I had organized then as a series of daily menus, lyric reflections, and narrative poems that use a collage and a hybrid format to detail how family deals with political differences, identity negotiation, and crisis. Um, shown through my lyric narratives on family stories, family values, and the enactment of supporting behaviors. And really a highlight of, of that was this idea of caregiving and the roles of, um, you know, feeling conflicted about, because um, I stayed there for a while, but feeling conflicted about, um, you know, having a child that was so many miles away, right, during what we don't know what, you know, what's going on, right, during, during COVID, you know, and also a partner. So, what happens when these roles of like daughter, like if I was a good daughter, I would stay, I would right, stay longer than that. But if I was a good mother, I would, you know, be back with my child. And what about, what about the um, spousal role? So that's what this, this project was really um, dealing with. And I will, um, I will end reading one of the poems with um, this, that was on this particular postcard. Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, you'll see here is that um, this, this kind of sums up some of, um, some of the um, issues that were going on. Um, okay, Dear Alice, July 8th, 2020. Today would be your 112th birthday. They tell me that I look like you, though I could never find my face in dad's wedding photo the cat eye glasses, three strings of pearls, Sunday white gloves clasped in one hand and that 1962 wave in your silver hair. You died when I was three months old, too young to know you except in family stories, the currency of connection. I wonder what you would think of COVID and the visit I had with my dad, your oldest son, during the, oldest, the early days of the pandemic. You would have been 10 and 11 through the 1918 flu epidemic, the same age as my daughter during this year of divisive unleadership and the scorn for science and intellect. Though my Facebook contacts are unfriending and blocking the Fox News watchers like my family, estrangement is not an option for me at the end of the world. Uncle Ed sent me a photo of a younger you Seeing my face in your high school graduation photo triggers something I needed to carry on with the caring, the feeling of belonging, even as the atheist liberal sheep in this family. I focus on feeding and cleaning tasks that an overeducated daughter can do, like you did for your parents, delaying your marriage and kids. My dad said you always prepared nutritious food and enough of it, though you weren't known as a good cook. I look for more than a physical resemblance as I bake your sugar cookies and buttercreams too. When I lead a Girl Scout troop and do community service, I focus on the commonalities, the family values of doing, caring and acting, reframe nostalgia as a better path like common core math. I forgive them, which really means forgiving myself for feeling like I'm never enough. Okay, so that kind of summed up, right, some of, some of what was going on. Um, and I have one other um, exercise in the, pack, in the um, PDF packet that I put there for you all. Um, I hope that as I was talking through some of the projects that maybe you got some ideas um, for some of your own work. I've included in there um, an idea for poetic transcription. So here's the idea that you could take um, some field notes that you have, maybe you have an interview transcript or two, and you will create um, a poetic transcription and a found poem. Okay, so if you're if you're a little weary of like, oh, I don't know about this poetry stuff, this is a great place to start. Um, 
Yeah, um, I see some of you said, yeah, I use poetic transcription in my dissertation. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, I often will will use poetic transcription even in um, traditional, more traditional kinds of um, interview projects, right? Because I find that the way, you know, arranging words on the page in a certain way helps me to analyze the interview and see, right, to see what's going on in different ways than a more traditional kind of transcript. But here I have, I have that for you all. Um, and I also have included in there references, right, for the slides here, as well as um, some some of my recent poetic inquiry publications in case you want to look any of those up. And I also want to say um, what I included, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click back right here on the first slide. I've got my email address um, as well as um, uh, a website if you wanna check out some more of my work. Um, Leslie, I can put, I'll put a, the link to the PDF again. It's further up in the chat. It might be um, too far up. So I think I've left enough time for discussion. So thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Sandra. Uh, we will do the following, which is going to be, I think a lot of people will really appreciate this and hoping that you're going to go along with this. So next month, uh, August, the fourth Wednesday, I would like to invite you to come back and for us to invite everybody here to come back for a deeper dive and to invite others who wish to watch those, what we've shared, what you've shared in advance and come back for a deeper discussion for another hour. Uh, it'd be the fourth Wednesday, 12 p.m. And I'd love to have you come back if it works out. We'll send a note out to everybody here because we have your registration and your email and we'll invite more people and we'll invite them to read, try the exercises and come ready to kind of go deeper, we'll create a, a deeper conversation so we can debrief on that. So in closing, I'd like to give you uh, my poem uh, for a thank you. And so I'm gonna put it in the chat and then I'm gonna read it to you and we'll be done for the day. So here we go. Well, let me read it and then I'll hit enter. Or I'll hit enter those who like to read along. So I call it the slippery skinny thank you. A slippery skinny thank you. I thank you from my heart my mind, my body, spirit, and imagination. I thank you from that dormant part of me that yearns to breathe. I thank you for your gift of living large beyond your dissertation. Living into your life as poetry, poetry that ripples and knits throughout the world that is with us today. Thank you. Everybody, you'll hear from us. Bye for now. Thank you, everybody.